Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about video ML at scale, uh, which basically means video ML for people who want to make money. Uh, and so uh, thank you for the, the intro. I, as far as who I am, I'm working uh, now at Snap and previously worked on ML at Mox. Um, as a bit of forewarning for this presentation, uh, when I submitted the talk, I was still working at Mux, uh, which is a, a, a video startup in San Francisco. And uh, some of the information uh, that I was going to present, I no longer had access to that material when I went to uh, Snapchat this uh, summer. Uh, so I'm not going to be talking as much on the production pipeline uh, as in the description. But if you're interested in that, feel free to grab me after the talk. Uh, so why video ML? Um, at all. It seems like everywhere we turn, people are talking about AI this, AI that. Uh, granted, we are at a data conference, so some of that is our own doing. Uh, but where do we even really want to use uh, ML in video? And uh, to answer that, let's look at how video is being delivered uh, today. And when I say video, by the way, I mean uh, OTT video, not broadcast TV, um, but streaming video online. So the way that works today, it's basically uh, you have some sort of content source uh, that you ingest into a cloud uh, or on-prem transcoder um, that gets passed um, to a CDN origin server, uh, which gets then passed to edge servers uh, that go to a wide assortment of user devices uh, as ABR manifest um, so that uh, you reduce the latency and maintain uh, a good quality uh, of experience for, for all your users. Uh, and hopefully you also have some data analytics the back end, although you're probably not using the data analytics um, to change very much because there's you know, 100,000 offset along this chain. Um, and so you're really just using it for monitoring. So where does ML kind of fall into this? Well, it actually falls into basically every step. So uh, on the, starting in the very beginning on the source creation, we can use ML for uh, uh, highlight generation, scene detection, uh, video categorization, uh, deepfake detection is becoming increasingly um, a concern. In the last uh, month, Facebook just released a new data set on uh, doing a deepfake detector. Um, so that's just at the point in which the video ingested, we can already do a bunch, create a bunch of machine learning models that adds value uh, to the viewing experience. On the transcoding uh, side, we're looking at things like uh, ML based per title or per shot encoding, uh, no reference video quality assessment, which um, is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, the vast majority uh, if you, uh, of content providers, if they're using, they're even tracking video quality, which is a maybe uh, in, in their monitoring, uh, it's usually using a full reference video quality metric in which you're comparing a, a source frame with a distorted frame. Uh, and uh, you're comparing pixel by pixel to try to figure out what the video quality is. But perceptual video quality doesn't actually work that way in video for humans because there's things like motion blur or even more insane things like when we add in distortion, like film grain, and we actually like it. Um, and so that's, even though that's distortion, that's better quality rather than a worse quality. And so that stuff is really, really hard to uh, detect um, in a deterministic way uh, without machine learning. In CDN, you do smarter caching and storage. On um, the playback side, um, there's uh, a lot of interesting algorithms like um, the evolution of uh, ML ABR algorithms. Uh, MIT published a paper a few years ago called uh, PenSeed, in which they're able to drastically reduce rebuffering uh, for the same bit rates. Uh, there's video super resolution, um, in which that image uh, on the bottom uh, right there shows that uh, three different um, frames. It's zoomed in, uh, but uh, the, the one on the left is bicubic upscaling, which is the um, default for the majority of players out there. Um, video super resolution is the one in the middle, and the ground truth is the one on the right. So you can see there's huge, huge gains to be made uh, for using uh, things like super resolution as part of video players. And then uh, as part of that, your, your analytics also evolves to be more than just monitoring, but also optimization uh, for the ML within your, your video stack. Uh, and then so you really enter this, this positive feedback cycle of continuous improvement. Uh, so uh, it sounds great, right? We get higher quality video, less buffering events, uh, we drastically reduce our costs, um, and overall, uh, just a richer viewing experience in which no longer is OTT trying to really reach parity 
with broadcast TV, uh, but uh, really actually exceeds it. Uh, so what are some of the challenges of being able to do this? Because uh, naturally, something that great would have uh, equally great challenges to it. So uh, the first one is the complexity when it comes to video machine learning. So the machine learning uh, models over there, one, the, the, all the use cases that I just described, they're very different ML implementations, uh, right? And so uh, not only are you looking at um, complexity on, in the spatial dimension, but also uh, temporally as well. Uh, so your, your input and your output uh, can involve multiple frames, uh, and uh, this really drastically uh, it increases the complexity, especially when you consider that a lot of uh, image uh, machine, le uh, machine learning models with you know, convolutional layers, they, they act as a funnel and shrink over time, so your dimensions rapidly um, get cut down. But for, for things like super resolution, for example, you're, it's, a, it's an upscaling algorithm. So your dimensions, um, sometimes they shrink, sometimes it's sort of like an hourglass shape, but the, the end output is a low frame to high frame um, output. So you're going from low to high dimensions. Uh, so your, your complexity um, there is many times greater than something like uh, Inception or ResNet. Um, and because of the way that you're trying to account for temporal uh, complexity, you also have a lot of different ways that you're sampling uh, your frames, um, uh, which leads to more and more complex model architectures as well. Uh, and so as the complexity increases, you encounter the next uh, challenge, which is the latency. Uh, and so video has really, really strict latency requirements. When you're looking at 24 FPS video, that's 42 milliseconds per frame. For 30 FPS, it's 33 milliseconds. Uh, default, kind of, if you download Inception off of ModelZoo, um, that's about 100 to 500 milliseconds per frame, depending on the CPU you're running on. Um, and uh, that is nowhere close to being uh, fast enough to, to integrate as part of uh, video um, every single frame. And that's you know, taking in a, a downsized frame as an input and outputting that softmax layer, which is a really low dimension output as well. Um, uh, another problem is training data, which is, let's say you manage to figure out how to solve these really, really difficult video uh, latency and complexity uh, challenges. but how do you get the training data uh, for your model? Because um, there's a lot of video out there, but even trying to find the right subset of the video uh, for your product can be uh, really difficult. If, you're using, if your product is UGC content, um, then downloading the you know, uh, Netflix's archive of videos uh, might not really train your model um, and give you the results that you want to see uh, because you just see content just behaves differently uh, versus premium type content. So what are some solutions to this? Uh, well, first, obviously, optimize your model. Um, but really try to understand the trade-off between accuracy and complexity here. A lot of research papers, they just talk, they, do, they benchmark accuracy, right? And, and you're supposed to just tire the highest number is the best. Um, but really, when it comes to production, at scale deployment uh, of ML models, you're, you're wanting that you know, Pareto curve uh, trade off of the, the most bang for your buck. So, just good enough is basically what you're looking for. And you know, here we look at model size versus accuracy of inception, uh, and we see like the quantized uh, version of session v3 does give you a slight hit in accuracy. Uh, you know, maybe a half a percent, but it's uh, about a fourth of the size of the non-quantized model. So pruning, quantization, using the TF graph transfer tool is really useful for this. Um, but uh, going through the step of evaluating the, the trade-off between accuracy and complexity is very, very necessary before you do anything else. Um, using, there's a lot of, over the past few years, there's a lot of great uh, TensorFlow tools I've, I've mostly worked with TensorFlow as well, which is why this is all TensorFlow-focused. Um, so uh, there's a lot of great TensorFlow tools out there for um, converting your models into lighter weight versions like TF Lite as well. Um, once you've optimized your model, look at your infrastructure. So are you building TensorFlow from binaries, or are you co compiling uh, from source using the CPU optimizations? Um, doing this is a huge difference, um, and it's not that really 
uh, much more technically difficult um, to do. Um, also take advantage of building using the serving infrastructure uh, of TensorFlow uh, as a microservice. Um, you know, TS serving is an easy uh, integrated gRPC service that you can basically um, containerize and deploy um, and does things like model versioning for you um, and as part of the TFX framework um, that does a lot of, of the heavy lifting. Um, I, two years ago, I probably would not have recommended TF serving, but there's been so much work uh, done in it and that continues to be done on that um, it really is sort of like TF, TFX, Kubeflow, that whole environment um, it is continuing to evolve uh, really nicely for large scale deployments. So, and then GPUs is kind of the obvious choice um, uh, for improving the latency, uh, but of course it has the downside of much higher costs and only being uh, available on the server side. Um, something else you can do is look at sampling, um, but the sampling really depends on your use case as well. So for things like video categorization, detection, uh, you might be able to sample at one to two frames per second, right? Uh, and, and if that, uh, for things like categorization. Um, and that's, that's totally fine. And, but things for reference-free quality metrics, you might want to sample at a higher rate uh, than that because um, we can detect changes uh, in quality um, at a greater frequency. For things like super resolution, that kind of needs to be every single frame. Um, and so your use case here um, really dictates how well you can sample um, and, and to try to uh, lower your latency requirements. Uh, data set generation uh, is something that is widely used uh, for, to generate video corpus as well. Um, let's say you want to create a video categorization model instead of um, uh, trying to find a data set that doesn't quite, uh, or trying to curate like a million video data set uh, from uh, the, where, whoever your user group is. And say you can hand label thousands of videos or maybe a thousand uh, videos train a uh, supervised model on that, then use that to uh, create machine uh, labels on a larger corpus, and then train a, a weekly supervised model from that larger corpus. Uh, Facebook does this. Uh, this is a really, um, really effective way of generating large corpuses of data sets. But there's also a lot of data sets available uh, out there that have been published. Um, but many of them are very focused uh, and niche, and so you can also sample across uh, sort of publicly available data sets uh, as well. Uh, lastly, the, uh, utilizing the TFX framework, um, basically there's just a lot of uh, built-in tools around model validation, uh, generating uh, the right uh, uh, it, statistics, as well as it sort of all works um, in as either Airflow or, or Kubeflow um, runtimes, and so it's, it's very easy uh, to deploy uh, and integrate um, within your current system. And the, um, the model versioning um, and deployment is a, a critical piece here because you're going to have a fairly high, or you likely have a, a fairly high uh, fan out of, of user groups. Um, and so a model that, it's fairly unlikely to find one model that might work for just a single user group. Um, and so having that robust framework around model validation is also key to have um, a, a quick iteration on your model plans. Uh, so all that said, none of these solutions really solve those challenges that I mentioned. Um, and that's because the, the ML uh, uh, deployments are, are really difficult and will take a really long time before we see them um, in, at, at scale in production um, commonly. And the modern OTT video workflow took many, many years uh, to reach that stage. Um, but if we uh, start now um, to, to work towards this better future with ML in our video, uh, I uh, look forward to a future in which you know, viewing a video on my laptop is a much superior uh, viewing experience than it ever will be um, than uh, viewing it on traditional broadcast TV. No offense to any tra traditional broadcast TV people here. Thank you. Any questions? You have nine seconds. Eight, seven, six, five. All right, cool. Thank you. <laughs>